Welcome to A Word Fitly Spoken, a podcast about Jesus, His Word, and our joy in following Him. I'm Michelle Leslie. And I'm Amy Spreeman. And tonight, Michelle and I are very excited to bring you part one of a two-part series on a topic a lot of Christian women have questions about, and that is hospitality. Listeners, when you hear someone say the word hospitality, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Well, here's what I think of. Actually, two things. Neighborhood coffee gatherings and fancier parties with all the crystal serving bowls and punch. You know, um, growing up in the 60s and 70s, the moms in our little suburbia neighborhood were always gathering at each other's homes, and the kids all played elsewhere in the hostess's home. Uh, we often got into a boatload of trouble because the ladies just ignored us. But when we did pop into the dining room to hang out with them, we would always be privy to the advice, like how to raise better behaved children or clean a stained porcelain sink. And the, of course, the gossip. Did you know Mrs. Nelson's husband left her for his secretary and she still wants him back? Yeah, that actually happened. Names are changed, of course. Um, but, you know, you, you learn a lot at the at the knees of these moms. But the fancier parties uh, that I remember often involved an occasion like an anniversary or someone's promotion. You know, the silverware was polished and I had to wear a, a dress with scratchy legs and white gloves, and there were always those puffy mints to go around. And that's what I grew up thinking hospitality was all about. How about you, Michelle? Yeah, I have some of those same childhood memories. I remember the, um, well, when I was little, my dad was in the army. And so we, you know, we always lived on on post or or close to post or whatever. And uh, they would have, those were called coffee clatches. Remember that? Yes, yes. Yeah. And the, the, um, the military wives would always get together and, and, and be friends and whatnot. And I, I, I remember that when I was really, really little. Um, but now, now that I'm older, the first thing that comes to my mind is about 20 ish years ago, I had this friend from church named Rachel. She was fantastic. She was around my age. So her kids were basically the same age as my younger kids. And she had a lovely home and she would have birthday parties for her kids and fellowships for our adult Sunday school class and all kinds of other events that our family would attend at their house. And her home was always immaculate at these events and just beautifully decorated with flowers and candles and centerpieces and whatnot. And it just looked like something out of a magazine. And I thought, you know, this this is hospitality. And if I'm going to be more hospitable, I need to go out and get more candles, you know, <laughs> because I had five boys, one girl, and at least one dog most of the time. And even if we could have afforded expensive furniture and rugs and vases and stuff, we wouldn't have bought it. Our house had that lived in look because it was lived in. <laughs> yep. It was an absolute frat house a lot of the time. And I used to think, well, I guess I'll never be hospitable because my house will never be nice enough or tasteful enough or well decorated enough, no matter how many candles I buy. Someday when the kids are older and the house is nicer, then I'll be hospitable. Yeah, I think the things that Michelle and I have shared is what a lot of us think about when the topic of hospitality comes up. We see the pictures in better homes and gardens and house beautiful Pinterest. Some of us are older to remember, though, Martha Stewart before she went to jail. Uh, we hear mm -hmm. hospitality and we think of having 12 people over for like a, a formal dinner on fine china in our beautifully decorated, expensive homes. And of course, we are wrong. That is not hospitality. At least it's not the Bible's idea of hospitality. What we think of as hospitality is in reality, entertaining. That's what we think. Biblical hospitality is welcoming others because Christ has welcomed us. It is loving others because he first loved us. It is inviting others to feel like part of the family because we have been adopted into God's family. And you don't have to have a picture-perfect house and a dinner party to do those things. We should be doing those things wherever we go with everyone we encounter. Hospitality is a posture of heart that should be a normal character trait of all Christians. That's right, Amy. But 
What does that mean both biblically and practically? Well, let's dig mm-hmm. a little deeper into what the Bible says about hospitality. And we're going to look at two different types of scripture on this, descriptive and prescriptive. So take a little time for Bible teaching here. Descriptive passages describe something that happened. Descriptive describe. See, there, you know, these passages are narrative. Noah built an ark. Esther became queen. Paul got shipwrecked. These are just passages that tell us what happened to somebody. They're not telling you to go build an ark or become a queen or that one day you'll be shipwrecked. All right. So that's descriptive passages. Prescriptive passages are commands or statements to obey. Don't lie. Share the gospel. Forgive others. Descriptive passages can support, but never trump prescriptive passages. That's right, Michelle. I, I love that concept because it's, uh, it's something that we all need to learn as Christian women, uh, the difference between those two. So first, we're going to take a look at some biblical commands about hospitality. These would be the prescriptive passages Michelle was talking about. So grab your Bibles, ladies. Here we go. Let's start with Matthew seven twelve. It says this. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, this passage that's usually called the golden rule, it's actually the heart of how we do hospitality. How can I make someone else feel as loved and welcomed and special as I'd like to feel? And then let's look at Romans fifteen seven. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. So we are to welcome your brothers and sisters in Christ the same way Christ has welcomed you. It fosters biblical unity in the church and thereby glorifies God. And then Romans twelve thirteen says this, Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. In this verse, Paul doesn't really elaborate on what hospitality is or anything else about it, probably because his original audience would have already known what he meant. And there's really not much context in the surrounding verses to help us because it's sort of a rapid fire bullet point list of things. But even from the little bit of context that we have in the surrounding verses, we can see that these are all godly characteristics and good works that we are to carry out. That's right, Amy. Those are some really good um, commands and instructions and prescriptive passages about hospitality. And let's look at one more. This is going to be 1 Timothy 5, 9 through 10. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. So this is not an overt command in the sense of you do this, you do that, you don't do this, you don't do that. But it does show us that hospitality is a good work the church should expect from godly women and that godly women should display over the course of their lives. Let's notice a couple of things about this passage. First of all, if you're using the ESV like I am and some other translations as well, you'll notice that after the words good works, there's a colon before the rest of the sentence. And if you're a grammar nerd like me, you know that that colon (laughs) indicates what's to follow. It's a list of or examples of whatever came right before the colon. So all of these things brought up children, shown hospitality, and so on. These are examples of the good works these godly women are to have done over the course of their lives. And then verse 10 just bookends that passage by reiterating, has devoted herself to every good work. Okay, another thing. Look back over verses 9 and 10 at this list of qualifications for these godly older women who are widows. Does it remind you of a similar list of qualifications for another position? Think about that. Notice that phrase, the wife of one husband there in verse 9. Sounds just a little bit like the phrase, the husband of one wife, right? Which we find in the the list of qualifications for pastors and elders just two chapters earlier in 1 Timothy 3 and then also in Titus 1. And guess what other qualification those two lists and this one have in common? Hospitality. That's right. 
Pastors and elders are to be hospitable. Godly older women, who Titus 2 tells us are to teach and train younger women, are to be hospitable. The Holy Spirit, who breathed out these passages, wants us to know that being faithful to your spouse, being hospitable, and so on, are important character traits to look for in those who lead and teach others. And then one more thing. Look at that phrase right after, shown hospitality. See that? Shown hospitality has washed the feet of the saints. And that kind of sounds similar to the verse that Amy just read, Romans 12, 13. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. So there's a strong possibility here that hospitality is connected to contributing to the needs of the saints, taking care of the saints, washing the saints' feet. And who are the saints? Well, we are Christians, the church. So it's likely that both of these verses are talking about taking care of the needs of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah, Michelle, those prescriptive passages prescribing what we should be doing are so helpful uh, when it comes to understanding hospitality. Now let's move on to some descriptive passages of biblical examples of hospitality. But before we get started on these passages, I want to give you an illustration that will help you understand how we'll be looking at them. So picture a flower bud in your mind. Now, as we record this, it's the middle of winter. It's freezing. I haven't seen flower (laughs) buds in a long time. But if you picture a flower bud that hasn't bloomed yet, it still has that hard green covering over the petals. When that flower blooms, it breaks out of that hard cover and those green shards that were once covering the petals bend back behind the flower. Those pieces of that covering are known as sepals. It rhymes with steeples, right? So when the flower blooms, the sepals are still part of the flower. But when the sepals aren't the main point of the flower, so to speak, the flower is the main point of the flower. You see where we're going with this. In these passages we're about to look at, hospitality is the sepal, not the flower, of the passage. We can legitimately learn some things about hospitality from these passages, but it's incidental. It's not the main point of the passage. Right. That's a great illustration, Amy. You know, our first sepal passage, if you will, is in Genesis 19. This is the story of the two angels coming to Lot in Sodom the day before God wipes it off the map. So let's start with verses one through three. This is Genesis 19, one through three. Here we go. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth. Okay, why did Lot do that? Why did he bow himself with his face to the earth? Well, it was a sign of respect and of honor. It's sort of a way of saying, uh, I'm your humble servant. What can I do for you? So does this mean that we have to literally bow with our faces to the earth when we meet a visitor? Well, no, but the principle that we can learn from this passage is to show others respect and honor and seek to serve others in humility. Verses two and three say this, that, and this is Lot speaking, my lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, no, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Now, we know the rest of the story, so we know these are angels. Lot doesn't know that. To Lot, these are just traveling strangers. Does biblical hospitality require you today to take random transients into your home to spend the night? No, this was a a custom of the time, not a biblical law. There could conceivably be some circumstance in which you might take some unknown person into your home, but this is not a habitual practice scripture requires of you as a New Testament Christian. So he calls them my lords, and he calls himself your servant. Again, he's showing them honor and respect, showing that he's humbly at their service. Yeah, he does. And and notice how Lot says in verse two, turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. He's welcoming them into his home for a place to sleep and shower, basically, Mm -hmm. and then he'll send them on their way in the morning. So what's the principle here? We're to be welcoming to people to provide for to provide for their needs. 
But still they respond, no, we will spend the night in the town square. Verse three, but he pressed them strongly. So another part of me, of Middle Eastern hospitality at that time, and, and we even do this today, was for the recipient of the hospitality to initially demur. No, that's okay. You don't have to put yourself out like that. We'll be just fine right here in the town square. You know, we, we do that even today. Well, we especially do that up here in, in the north. We're, we're polite, we think, uh, to a fault. <laughs> so. Oh, no. Yeah, we we do it down here too. So so we go through that, you know, we go through that, or the the people in in the Middle East at that time would go through that, and then the the one extending the hospitality would insist. No, I insist. It's no trouble at all. Now we we do that in American culture, but that's where we tend to stop. You know, if we offer and they resist, and then we say it's no trouble. And they say, no, I, I'm okay or whatever. We just go ahead and stop and we, we respect their wish, the person's wishes. We let her turn us down. Okay. We don't insist. Middle Eastern hospitality carried this out to the extent that the person extending the hospitality would be greatly offended and insulted if you insisted on turning him down. Because to use this case for an example, these men that Lot was talking to, they would essentially be saying, Lot, your hospitality is so suspect. We'd rather spend the night in the town square and take our chances than come to your house. Oh, that's so interesting. But there's something else going on here besides Lot being offended. It says Lot pressed them strongly. Uh, And this is above and beyond the typical, no, no, I insist, hospitality of the time. Why? What made Lot press them strongly? Well, Lot lives in Sodom. He knows what these people are like. These out-of-towners are going to be assaulted, maybe even murdered, if they tried to spend the night in the town square. So what's the principle for us here? Lot is using his knowledge and experience to look out for their best interests. He's providing for their needs by offering them a safe place to stay. And verse 3 finishes up by saying, So they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. So they behave like good guests and accept Lot's invitation, and they eat what he offers them. And Lot is a good host. He made them a feast so they didn't just feel welcome. He pulled out all the stops to make them feel like celebrated and honored guests. One of the things we can learn from this is that hospitality is not one-sided. It's not just being a good host. It's also being a good guest as you graciously accept the hospitality that's offered. That's an interesting concept. Concept, Michelle. I think a lot of us feel a little uneasy about being a good guest sometimes. Yeah, it, it really is an important concept to grasp. We've heard all of our lives that it's more blessed to give than to receive. And yeah. that's true because that's what the Bible says. But, you know, we can't always be the giver and we have to learn how to be godly and gracious receivers too, whether that's, you know, a, a, a literal tangible gift or whether someone is off- offering us hospitality or, or whatever it is, we have to give other people the opportunity to be givers because we know that it brings yeah. them joy and we know that it brings them blessings. So we have to be good givers and good receivers. Well, there are a number of other examples of hospitality in Genesis. So listeners, let me give you an optional homework assignment if you'd like to do a little more study about the biblical principles of hospitality. Go through Genesis 24, 10 through 60, 61, excuse me. That's the story of Isaac's servant going to get Rebecca. So Genesis 24, 10 through 61. And then Genesis 29, 1 through 30. That's the story of Jacob arriving at Laban's house and marrying Leah and Rachel. So that's Genesis 29, 1 through 30. And go through those passages passages and look for examples of good hospitality and poor hospitality. And make sure you're remembering that these are descriptive passages, not prescriptive passages. God's not commanding you to go water anybody's sheep, okay? And so remember that and then draw out the general principle behind the good and bad or good or bad example that God wants us to follow or learn from. And when you're finished with that, while you've got your mind fixed on hospitality, see if you can think of any other passages in Genesis that show us something good or bad about hospitality. I can think of at least two other examples in Genesis. Maybe you can come up with more. All right. Those are great study ideas, ladies. 
Let's move on. Let's look at another sepal passage about hospitality. This is found in Luke 9, 10 through 17. And this is the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. So it goes like this. On their return, the apostles told him, that's Jesus, all that they had done. And he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. The first part of Luke 9 is the part where Jesus sends out the 12 uh, across Israel to preach and heal. So this is right after they get back from that. And Jesus is basically taking them on a little retreat to debrief and to rest. So let's continue in verse 11. When the crowds learned it, they followed him and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had a need of healing. Now, how many times has this happened to you? You've got plans to do something that's biblically legitimate and good, and all of a sudden, those plans get derailed because somebody needs something from you right now. Well, how did Jesus respond to this? He welcomed the crowd. He sacrificed what he had planned in order to serve others. Yeah, he did. Now, you do have to do this in good biblical balance, just like Jesus did, or you're going to kill yourself trying to do everything for everybody immediately. You know, we know that Jesus did find times to withdraw to quiet places to rest and pray, both with the disciples and alone, because Scripture tells us he did. And also, moms, you will not be doing your children any favors if you constantly give in to their demands immediately. Yeah. They need to learn the principles of hospitality, of waiting patiently, not being selfish and demanding, and not imposing on others. And you need to teach them that by sometimes telling them no or wait. So sometimes, like Jesus does in this passage, we cancel our previous plans in order to welcome others. We just need to use biblical wisdom to know when that is appropriate and when it's not. Absolutely. Let's continue in verse 12. It says this, Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. Yeah, look at this very interesting contrast. Verse 11, Jesus welcomes the crowd. And then, you know, a couple of verses later in 12, the disciples say, send them away. In verse 11, Jesus provides for the people's spiritual and physical needs, and that's teaching and healing. And then he did that himself. So verse 12 says, the disciples want to send the people to others out in the world to have their needs met. And look what Jesus said to them next. Verse 13, he said to them, you give them something to eat. Well, think about those New Testament commands we read earlier about Christians showing hospitality. At the time, Jesus is feeding the 5,000. It's just a couple more years until the establishment of the New Testament church. Remember, hospitality, welcoming people in, that's what it means, welcoming people in to have their needs met by the hands and feet of Jesus, not sending them away so they can try to get those needs met elsewhere. That's to be characteristic of the church and a character trait of the individual Christian. Hospitality isn't the main point of this story, of course, but it is one of the incidental things Jesus was impressing upon the disciples, the founding fathers of the church. That's what they were. And and as this event unfolded, so we need to welcome people in. We don't want to send them away, especially out into the world. We know what that's like. The church is really where people should be getting their needs met. It sure is, Amy. The We should really be welcoming people like yeah. Jesus did into the church so that we can help meet their needs, not send, sending them out into the world to try to get their needs met by somebody else. Well, continuing on with verse 13, the disciples said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we are to go and buy food for all these people, for there were about 5,000 men. Okay, let's not be too hard on the disciples here. They look out over a crowd of 5,000 hungry men plus women and children. So conservatively speaking, probably at least 10,000 hungry people, 12 of the disciples. They're looking out and seeing this. And Jesus says, you feed all those people. What would you say in that situation? We ought to put that on our our next what would you do, Amy? Uh, That would be a really hard one. (laughs) You know, think about it. What would you say in that situation? Probably the same thing they did. You know, we got to make groceries share. We got to break out the big jambalaya pots for this one. (laughs) <laughs> we'd say, oh, we'd say. yeah, yeah, I think we got some sturgeon in the freezer, but uh, I don't think we got enough there. 
(laughs) (laughs) The disciples thought pragmatically first, you know, unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. In other words, we got to handle this ourselves and come up with our own solution. But instead, they should have looked to Jesus for provision first. Yeah. Back to verse 14. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so and had them all set, sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces. Jesus gave the disciples what they needed to show hospitality. He gave them wisdom and instruction on how to organize. And what did they give him? They gave him everything they had. They gave him their obedience and they gave him their best efforts. And he blessed that. And then he gave the disciples the bread and fish to distribute. He provided for them so they could provide for others. And he did all of that to provide for the people's physical need for food in order to provide for their greatest spiritual need, their need for a savior. You know, here's some bread to feed the hunger of your body. I am the living bread that comes down out of heaven to feed the hunger of your soul. And that is ultimately why we show hospitality, to point lost people to Jesus and to point saved people back to Jesus. And that's where a common question about hospitality often comes up. Do we show hospitality to the brothers or to others? And that's where we're going to pick up next week. Amy, I don't know about you, but I've really enjoyed studying God's wor- what God, God's Word has to say about hospitality so far. Oh, me too, Michelle. We're going to continue digging into God's Word next week in part two of this little mini-series on hospitality. We're going to take a look at extending hospitality to Christians and to strangers. We're also going to discuss a few instances in which the Bible says we should not extend hospitality. And we're going to offer a few practical tips and guidelines to help you practice hospitality every day. Yeah, I can't wait. And I hope you listeners are looking forward to it as much as we are. You know, Amy, hospitality would be a great topic for us to teach about at a women's event. And I want to remind our listeners that if you're planning a women's conference or maybe a co-ed conference with breakout sessions just for women, Amy and I would love to come speak to your ladies together. Uh, You you know, we can do it separately, too, but we would love to come do it together. And you can get more information about that at the speaking tab at our website, a word fitly spoken dot life. We also want to periodically remind you that if you need any of our episodes in text form rather than audio, we have two ways you can get that. First, in the show notes of every episode, you can click the link that says transcript, or you can go to our YouTube channel and click the CC button at the bottom of the video, our video for that episode for captions. That's right. Well, ladies, thank you for listening. And remember, welcome others as Christ has welcomed you and walk worthy.